Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Uh -huh. Praise you, Jesus. The precious presence of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to your name. Lord, we just want to take time to thank you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, for the hour that we're living in, that you've chosen us for such a time as this. And there is no greater time than what you've chosen us for. We thank you, Lord, that you have put in us your precious Holy Spirit, who enable us to overcome every situation, every circumstance. And Lord, we are thankful today as we look up and we know that our redemption is drawing on for that great day of your appearing. We await you with joy in our heart, with resounding praise in our minds. We give you praise and glory for all that you are doing in our lives and in our families, and in our loved ones' lives. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. Thank you. And everybody said amen. amen. Hey, I hope you all enjoyed that. That was Brother Sid's uh, CD. Well, I, it was that was the first one he recorded in 2005. That was and we're waiting his new edition, which is going to be coming out soon. Praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles with you, we're going to continue our message at the gates of Nehemiah. How many of you are seeing things that perhaps you hadn't seen before? Yes. And learning things. And this is going to be message number four. Today we're going to talk about the window of opportunity. Nehemiah chapter 3. Let's read our text for today. Nehemiah 3 verse 6. After they had been through the fish gate, they now moved to the old gate and repaired to Hoadah, the son of Pasiah, and Meshulam, the son of Mesodiah. They laid the beams thereof and set up the door thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. So far, we have talked about in the first message about the year of turnaround using the gates of Nehemiah, finding your place at each gate. It is imperative for us to realize that this is not just an old Bible story. That these gates represent something in our lives because gates were important to the Jewish people. That's where everything was conducted. That's where prayer was conducted. That's where the priests ministered at the gates. Gates are very important to our lives because we're always going through this gate, through that gate of our life. And in that first particular gate, we talked about finding your place. The second gate, we talked about knowing your position. Every gate and every experience that you have with God, you've got to find these things. And you've got to know your position in the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about willing to work at each gate. How God begins to bring people together to unify in the things of God. Today, I want you to know that every portal of God has potential and possibility for every believer. Every time God opens up a portal, an entrance, a gate for us, we have potential and possibility for every believer. As we were reviewing this, we're going to review just for a moment. Remember that when Nehemiah got to the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, there had been a remnant left from captivity. And what did he find? He found that the gates were burned and that they were burned with fire. And that is representative of people who are people, church people, who've been walking with God for some time. You just go through this period of time in your life where you get the case of the burnouts. And this is where we're finding a lot of people uh, leaving churches today who are completely burned out with church. And so this is why we are in a shift in this particular time of our life. If you've not noticed this, the church world is shifting and God is going to do things differently. And in this province or district, 
they were afflicted, they were disagreeable, they were malignant, and they were just sick of religion. Now God is going to show up on the scene through the life of Nehemiah. And we re remember now reviewing the walls are symbolic of people's lives in need of being erected. How many of you know that there's some things in our life that still need to be erected? God needs to prop us up, get us back up on our feet. So I want you to hear this today. God has a plan, and He plants that plan and vision inside of whomsoever. Look at your neighbor, Simon, whomsoever. God is planning His plan and His vision in me. And in Nehemiah 2, we saw the opposition is still lurking. I call them the STG SWAT team. No matter what you do for God, no matter what you're facing at your gates of life, you're always going to have these three amigos, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. I call them the STG SWAT team. They have a plan, but God's plan is greater. Look at your neighbor says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Than he is in the world. And I want you to realize in reviewing, Nehemiah went through around all the city. In the last five years, I have had the opportunity of going all the way around this city and through many, many churches to see and observe the condition of the church. And so this is why I can understand a little bit of what Nehemiah was up against when he comes to this place in his life. He's been a cupbearer, and God brings him through all these gates, and he asks him in every gate, if you please, what do you see? So I'll ask you the question today, when you get to the gate of your life, whatever you're overcoming, what do you see? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself an overcomer, or do you see yourself defeated? So in every case, Nehemiah had to do this. There have been many gates already, but at every gate, every one, he had to seek God's face. He had to hear what God did, what he was saying. So he could do what? He could implement the plan and the vision that God wanted. So we're shifting in our church world today, and we're finding out that our plans may not be God's plans. So when we find out that they're not God's plan, and whatever you do, be it secular or spiritual, you have to begin to make your adjustments to what God wants. Psalms 24, verse 7, write this down if you're taking notes. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates, that's your gatekeepers, or the priests, and be you lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Somebody stop. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. When we lift up our heads, we lift up our hands, throw your gates, and be lift up, you everlasting doors. Sometimes you were a doorkeeper in God's house. And the King of glory shall come in. Here's what the Hebrew is saying about this. God is announced by the priest when he comes into the temple to, and he says, Behold, the King of glory is coming. Can you imagine that day when Jesus is going to break through that eastern sky and they were going to be blowing the trumpets and making the announcements. Behold, the King of Kings and the Lord of all. Make the hair stand in the back of my head. Just thinking about that. The majestic, that one who we have believed in all of our life. Finally, we have gotten to the place where we're going to see him just like he is. And the purpose of God sending Nehemiah to all these gates Listen to this carefully. To set up a place of refuge for his people. There are many people in this city, there are many people in the city where you live who are burnt, broken, rejected, do not attend church, you want to, don't want to be part of any kind of church system. But today we're going to look at this because the first thing, and I forgot my point, so forgive me. The first thing we're going to look at this morning, if you look at your board, is the revelation at this gate. Every gate we come to, in our life, we must have revelation. Say that to yourself. Every gate I come to, gate I, have I have to have revelation. I have to have revelation. Now the old gate is what we're going to be dealing with this morning. The old gate has a terminology and it means ancient. Ancient, something old, something antiquated. Joshua talks about in chapter 9 about old stores. Or Matthew chapter 9 talks about old wine, old bottle, something old, 
So the first thing you see about the revelation at this gate, when you come to the gate, is seeing the condition of the people. When I look at the church world today, in the spirit world, I see old ancient problems. They're doing the same thing they've been doing for 2,000 years, and we're not getting any further along down the road. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of religion. Yes, Me too. I don't want religion. I want to have a relationship with Him. And it doesn't offend me. People want to have religion. They had religious people in Jesus' day. Because ancient simply means this. Write this down. It's no longer new. It's absolutely worn by use. Everybody say, how many of you know when something is worn, it's worn? And sometimes we're creatures of habit. We like to keep your old pair of jeans or your old pair of shoes. But they're absolutely worn, so they're, they're asking for something new. But in church, this is what's happened. The word ancient means no longer new, worn by use. It's lost its ability, listen carefully, to reproduce God. Somebody ought to say hallelujah now. And so what happens, we, we don't change from the ancient, we remain that way, and we become religious in our activities. We do the same things, we go to the same places, we eat the same food, we hang around with the same people. And God is not able to bring us to a greater understanding and revelation, but that which is at the gate. So Nehemiah is standing at the gate, he, he knows who his enemies are, right? And, and he knows, he found his place, he knows, that, he knows his position, he's willing to work, and now he's coming today to a window of opportunity. At this gate, when all the odds are stacked against you, God has a window of opportunity. And you say, well, Pastor Ronnie, you ought to be more excited than that. I am excited. Because Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, talks about the old bottles. And the new bottles. It talks about the old wine and the new wine. The idea of oscillatory or being repetitious, going from side to side, but never forward. You know the old oscillating fan? Mm -hmm. If you're not sitting in the right place, you're not going to get any wind. Right. And, it, and, and it, it, it makes the same motion to the right, and it makes the same motion to the left. And it, it, it's really repetition. It's going back and forth and back and forth. So Nehemiah has to deal with this because, remember, he is coming from a Hebraic background. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew people of that time were very traditional. And they, were, and, and they love their customs and they love their laws and they love their festivities. They're not looking to come to this gate for change. They want the old to remain the old. And if you find this in the dividing line in the church today where the old folks want to remain with the old songs and the younger folks want to do the old hopped up songs. And how many of you know that in the middle it causes a problem? I know some traditional churches, they have two services on Sunday morning. One for the old hymns, one for the hop top, rock, rap, gospel, whatever you want to call it. They're having these things to, for them to do. But here at this revelation of this gate, here's the question that you're going to be asked when, when the Lord is standing there with you. What do you see, son of man? I mean, you know, we see a lot of things. But when we hear the Lord asking us, when we're seeing this, what do you see? First of all, you should see possibility and potential. Tell your neighbor, say, I see possibility and potential. How do you know? Say, well, I think it's useless. Can you see Nehemiah talking to God? I think it's absolutely useless. There's too much work to be done. There's not enough people to get it done. There's not enough funds to get it done. But remember, Nehemiah went all the way around the city with this footman, and he stopped at every gate to observe it. And at every gate, God will ask you the same question of your life. What do you see? And whatever he reveals to you, that's what he wants implemented. He is not interested in my plan. He's not interested in your plan. He's not interested in anybody else's plan because my plan is subject to failure. Yeah. But be of good courage, brethren. Your plan, if it's God's plan, it will succeed. 
And so when you look at the circumstances, but well, there's only two or three or four of them out there, and the Lord says, there's more behind the tree than you can recognize. Amen. Don't despite the forest for the trees. So the next thing, after seeing the potential and possibility at this all burnt down gate, the dung gate, the valley gate, the fountain gate, the fish gate, the sheep gate, we've come through all these gates, and he's still asking him the same thing. Here's the thought. When you're doing something just for the sake of doing it, it's what? Routine. Right? Right. It's natural to do something and being led by the Spirit every step of the way because it's spiritual. What is now natural to us should become supernatural. We should be responding and depending upon how the Holy Spirit is moving in our life, not about what somebody else believes, but what God showed me. You see, it's not about what you see now, it's what you saw when you were at the gate. So if you've got something inside of you in the last 20 or 30 years, however long you've been following God, and it has not changed, can I give you some good news? It's not going to change because that's what He wants to accomplish in your life. You will sit here, I will sit here for a purpose. This is good preaching. Y'all will be happy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory Amen. God. Amen. Amen. Keep on. Yeah. So, but in every situation, there's a little gray area that we don't understand. Write this down. We must become uncomfortable before we can be comfort comforted. It's in those uncomfortable places that God places us. It's where in these uncomfortable situations that we find ourselves, and that's the place we're going to see God. Okay. Somebody say, I'm going to see God in the most uncomfortable places. I don't see God in a comfortable place in church. I don't see God sitting at a comfortable table with my brother. I see God in the most uncomfortable places because in the uncomfortable places, I have to trust God instead of trusting myself. I have to rely on His ability in my, and I have to have His eyesight, not my eyesight. Okay, thank you. Hey! Hey, brother. I mean, I watch people try to figure God out and have headaches intellectually. And I go, God, this is not working. And so the first thing is seeing the condition of the people. Secondly, and the revelation at this gate, reviewing the present church age. We need to remind ourselves, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this is an old saying with the spiritual truth. He says, all things, I must say all things. All things. That means antiquated things, things from my past are passed away and all things become new. Watch this. The word new is the word kainos, fresh and uncommon. In case you thought I'd just drop this on you. When you're uncomfortable because it's uncommon. And if you're watching by the tube, I want you to realize, if you're uncomfortable in your present situation, it's because God's trying to bring you to a place where you can be comforted. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it seems like there ought to be more and God ought to be doing more. But are you doing more or doing less? And so at this gate, I wish I had a bigger board. There's a need. Everybody said there's a need. There's need. At every gate, there's a need. So a need for emerging sons. When I say son, we're talking about that no male and female in God. We're all the same gender. The sons there in John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, that particular son is not technon, is the teleos. That is the highest spiritual stage that we can come to. Can I get an amen? amen. When I get to teleos, not weos, not technon, when Pedion. When I get to tell you, it's the final stage of fifth, five spiritual growth. I get to the top. I'm maxed out. I have reached an age of maturity. I have some wisdom. I have some experience. When I get to that place, that plateau in my life, now God can send me to the uncommon places and He will make me comfortable because I know that there is nothing impossible with God to them that believe. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. But if I look at the situation and the circumstance, I can be easily discouraged and I can go home and feel sorry about myself. The devil in this one sent Balad and his what team came in and just whooped me up. But I said, oh well, it didn't work. But sometimes we got to get pressed through the thing. Right. This is a new challenge for me. I've never started a church in a building. I've always birthed churches in homes. Then we transition into the building. Yeah. So this is a whole new arena. I'm excited about the new challenge. Listen, I love a good challenge. Praise the Lord. Because the challenge is preparing me for the next stage and the next level God's going to bring me into. And I have to be pressed into, brethren, so the emerging sun, we have to rise up with authority. And the rest of the verse says, but as many as received him, take hold of it, it said, to them he gave power, exousia, ability, to become sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Amen. If I was to ask you, when you got born again, in your relationship with your Father, Heavenly Father, what was your greatest desire? Let's put it in the natural. What is the child's greatest desire, be it male or female, with a relationship with their father? Approval. Hmm? Approval. Approval. Love. Yeah. Got any more? Love. Hmm? So I, want, I want to be like him. Be like him? I'm, I'm meditating on things like this, and the Lord says, well, what was your greatest desire? I'll oh, oh, sleep and say it. I said, what? He said, what was your greatest thing when you first got saved? What did you want to do the most? Or what did you want to do in your life with the pleasing your father? I said, Lord, I, I just don't know how I would phrase this. He said, the son's greatest desire is to please his father. What was Jesus' greatest desire? What did he say? He said, of myself, I can do nothing. But he said, if you don't believe what I do, believe the works that I do. Because they speak of me. But for me and my father, we're one. Then he said to the Philippi church, he said, for I thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And you know when he said that, the religious people just blew the roof off. He's so who does he think he is? What kind of authority does this man speak with? Jesus knew who he was. He knew where he was going. And he knew that everything that he did pleased his father. That was his desire. What a God to have that kind of desire. The second thing we'll notice at this gate, the old gate, is you will have opportunity to hear and to work at this gate. Now, last week and the week before that and the week before that, we talked about in every gate, Nehemiah had the one they call repairment. Yeah. And so that gives you the understanding that this repairment of people who go out and repair things, build things, excuse me, use their hands. Is that correct? Yes. So, we're going to get the repairmen and take a different meeting today. So now the repairmen are going to take on the position of a ministry of helps. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul knows a little bit about these different types of ministries. So he begins to expound on these ministries in the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Corinthians 12, we're going to pick it up there. And last week or the week before that, we talked a little bit about diversities of people in the ministry, right? And how to unify, come together, and become one. It's, it's a word that God gave me quite a few years ago called synergizing. Yeah. I, I have a message on that that... Uh, 
I don't know quite yet if I'm going to preach this in Beaumont, but I'm going to be talking about compound anointing and those things of that nature on March the 15th. So, at the opportunity to work at this gate, now it's your turn, brethren, to ask God for help. How do you ask God for help? You just go, HELP! <laughs> There's no particular prayer. If the four-letter word does not change. When you're in a fix that you can't fix, that God has put you in, all you can do is go, HELP! That's right. Because no one man can build a ministry successfully all by himself. That old charismatic gaze. Get that. Old charismatic belief and gaze. The one man operation of ministry is way beyond our years. It passes. When you see great men on TV with mega churches, consider all the faithful people that are sitting under him that are doing the great part of the ministry, which is called ministry of helps, ministry of government, all these are working. So 12, 4. Say amen if you're there. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, Now there are diversities of spirit, of gifts, but the same spirit. Now we all have different giftings, right? But we all have the same spirit of our Father. You can look at your name says, My daddy and your daddy is the same daddy. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Because we have something in union, in common. So Nehemiah's question to God is, God, I need your help. This is too big for one person. Send some diversity of ministry. So he sends somebody. And some diversity of gift, but the same spirit, Numa, the Holy Ghost, one, distribution, different people of every nation will come. Verse 5, if you look at it, he says, and there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. An administration is one who executes the command of another. Different ministry, different function. Hebrews, I mean, 1 Corinthians verse 8. And look at this. <laughs> For to one is given by the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. Now drop to verse 20, uh, 28, where I want to go. And God set some in the church first apostles. So the you know, Paul's going to debate this issue. We can't all be apostles, right? right. Can we agree on that? Yeah. And we can't be all prophets. We can't all be evangelists. We can't all be teachers. But watch this. And God said some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps. That's what Nehemiah needed. Help, government, and diversity of some. Then he asked the question, are all apostles or all prophets? So Nehemiah is looking and viewing the walls. Remember, he, he started this and viewing the wall. He went through the valley gate. And he comes back into the city after going around the city. And he's now looking at this old gate. <coughs> and I have to think like Nehemiah thought. But my Lord, ain't no wonder why nothing changed. They're doing the same thing they've been doing 2,000 years ago. Are y'all warm? It's warm. <laughs> I'll fix that. Now, you think about it. He's a man. He's a cupbearer. He's been being a cupbearer of a Persian king. His beliefs are a whole lot different than Nehemiah, even though Nehemiah was born out of captivity. But he comes with a different revelation. Now, to all of the people that came of the remnant that, of that captivity, why did God pick Nehemiah? Somebody give me an answer. His name means Jehovah's Comfort. Mm. In your midst of your trouble, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your situation. Isn't it wonderful when some brother or sister comes along your way and cross paths with you and has a word of comfort? Yes. 
Nehemiah could have said, oh Lord, it looks bad. No, he said, it's not as bad as it thinks. It just needs a little cleaning up. We need to put some walls back up. Put a roof on the building now. You know, get all the joints jointly working together, edifying one another, building one another. So here's the help he sends him. Go back to, to Nehemiah. I just want to bless you with when you're dealing with an old situation that doesn't want to seem to change. Can this be an encouragement to you? God's got some help for you. Yes. Hallelujah. But it's your responsibility to meet Him at the gate to get the revelation. Because now, we talked about last week, willing to work. Now you have the opportunity to hear and to work. Watch what he says. Back to Nehemiah 3. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada. Everybody said, Jehoiada. Guess what his name means? Jehovah knows. <laughs> Guess what he's going to bring to the ministry, Brother Neil, of Nehemiah? Knowledge to build. Hello? Hallelujah. That's knowledge good. to build. That's good now, I have knowledge to build a physical building, but building a spiritual building, I'm going to say it publicly. Hey! Right. <laughs> then the next person they bring alongside is Meshulam. That's a roll your tongue one. Means friend. So now Nehemiah has two compadres. We're going to call them. He had now two elders in the church, Brother Neil. Okay. One means Jehovah knows he's a knowledgeable one, and the other one means he's a friend of God. I would like to have those two compadres on my team. Amen. That's right. Whether it's secular work or spiritual work, I would want people like that by my side. Yeah. But had Nehemiah lost hope when he saw how what shape was in, he could have easily done what most Christians do or most people do. This is too much for me. It costs too much. It's not worth this time. I could do better staying at home. So what verse is that? Hmm? What verse is this? Nehemiah 3.6. He's at the old gate. And he has two of his compadres. Now they list the sons of this one and the son of that. But I wanted you to see what they do. Here's the ministry of health at work. They laid the beams. How many of you know that every good building has a good beam in it? Yes, that's right. And we discussed this already. So beams are what? They're supporters. Mm -hmm. They support the physical and they support the spiritual. And then they set up the doors. How many of you know it's, it's a wonderful thing to walk into a church building and have a, a door greeter? Yes. Not somebody that had been eating sour persimmons. Says, hey, praise the Lord. How you doing, child? Well, hey, what's up? <laughs> and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. I heard two ministers having a conversation. Two great men of faith in the body of Christ on national TV. The older gentleman asked the younger gentleman, what do you require of people working under you to be successful in your ministry? And he said, excellence. Excellence. Not a halfway done job, not the El Shippo route, excellence. Why, he said, do you require that? Now he knows the answer. He's asking the younger man. He said, because God requires of me excellence. I am serving the King of kings, the Lord of all the earth. I am a child of the King. Why should my concept be less than what he wants for me, yet I'll ask him for something less and mean, mean you, so it doesn't offend him. You cannot offend him. He owns everything. And he already prepared all this before you ever showed up. But he says, our old concept, but when he said that, I'll, I jump. The old gate concept is, well, you know, brother, we're a small church and 
we, we can't afford to do this right now and you know that would, it's not in the budget but you know, if God would be merciful to us, and send, God is merciful. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Tiskanu. He is Makeda. He is all these things. He's already set it in place. But He wants to bring us to the revelation of what did I tell you? Let me read it to you again. We must become uncomfortable before we can be comforted. He is going to bring us to the uncommon places. So in uncommon places, let's not forget where we are, we're going to encounter uncommon people. Mm -hmm. I asked the Lord when we rebirth the church, I said, well, are we expecting some of the old folks to come back? I mean, not at age, people who were with us before. He said, go look at the gate and expect for me to do the impossible. Don't look at what you had before or what you have present. Look at what you're going to have. I said, that's fine. I can do that. So here we are at the gate. So here's a good scripture for you. Secondly, after you've asked God for help and the opportunity to hear Him at this gate and work, this is a catchy little phrase. I think you'll like it. Be sure the Word will find you out. <laughs> You're a student of the Word, right? Now let's take this in the context that it is written in Numbers 32, 23. He says, be sure your sins will find you out. So you're not necessarily at the gate sinning. You may be doubting, not understanding. And you may have desires. But your desires may be good, but not necessarily from God. The first thing our little finite minds to do when we see a need, we want to run and try to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. We've not taken time to find out the revelation, what is the opportunity, the potentiality, and we've not taken time to, to, to hear God to say, I hear I want you to go and do this and hear what, how you're going to implement it. God has a plan. He's an architect. He has it all designed. You've got to get it from Him, then you can go and implement it. Now you can have the desire, you can have the dream in your heart, but you still got to believe God to get it. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I've got dreams that I'm not going home with. I want to see them fulfilled before I leave this planet. Amen. And I'm not going to let St. Ballet nor Tobiah, nor Geshem, that little SWAT team, I'm not going to let them stop me. Amen. But think about this awesome thought. I wrote this on my sheet. Wow, just think if we were left to our own desires. <laughs> Scary already, isn't it? Yes, it is. Number three. Knowing what I am hearing at this gate. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ask yourself this question while you're turning there. How will I know that what I'm hearing is from God? How would you like to know that today? Yes. How could you like to leave here knowing without a doubt what you are hearing is from God? If you're listening to me, listen to this. If you're hearing something, you can know whether you're hearing from God or another source. Do you think that the devil will encourage you to go win souls? No. Yeah. Oh, no. Take your ease. Sit here, have another Coke. Get, eat another donut. Make another cup of coffee. But in Ezekiel chapter 2, in verse 1, I want you to notice this, knowing what you're hearing at the gate. Look how God speaks to Ezekiel. And he said, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. I'm standing on my feet. If you were standing right now, you'd be standing on the feet. But I'm not hearing anything. That's because you're standing in your, in your feet. When you stand in the presence of God, 
You've got to realize you're standing in the presence of a holy God and you are His righteousness in Christ Jesus. You are joint heirs with Him and it is the King of the Father's pleasure to give these things to His children. Not with the concept, well, I don't know. Maybe you'll give it to me. Maybe you won't. With a beggar's mentality. You see, we, God has brought us through all these different gates in our lives and continues to bring us through these different gates because we have left a secular, religious type world to come into a spiritual kingdom. And in the kingdom, He has principles and He has order and He demands excellence because when you ask Him for bread, He's not going to give you a stone. Somebody say, oh, I feel like preaching. <laughs> Secondly, watch this. He said, and the Spirit, do you write in your Bible? Mm -hmm. Write your name there. The Spirit entered into me. Moi. That's you. Write your name. Whatever your name. When he spake unto me and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. The Spirit of God has so moved. Now we know in the Old Testament writing, I know we're talking about Old Testament, for you theologians, that the Spirit came upon them. But I'm talking to you about a principle in John 16, 30, 13. says, how be when the Spirit of truth has come, He will lead you, He will guide you, He will instruct you, He will not speak of Himself, but that which He heard the Father say, and show you things to come. Yes, yes. But let's take this home. When the Spirit speaks to us of God, and He comes and He enters into us, that means that spirit of wisdom and knowledge and, and fear of the Lord, whatever you need for that situation at the gate, when it is entered you, it's not going to leave until it is fulfilled. Oh, amen. Praise God. <laughs> gotcha, devil. So if you've been sitting on a nest egg for 30 years, or 25 years, or 40 years, or no matter 50 years, 60 years, and God has promised you something when you got born again, His Word is still true, and He put it in you, and He will bring it to pass. You just got to get to the gate, get a revelation, be ready to work, and begin to implement it, and know that you heard. Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. Amen. Yay! Amen. Have a drink. Because it's at this gate. <coughs> Not only will you hear God, the SWAT team's going to come back. No, brother. Look at you. You didn't really hear God, did you? Or the old serpent. Eve, you sure God told you that you couldn't eat from this tree? Mine, he said, your eyes will be opened if you do. Her eyes were already opened. That's where Cornelia came in. She went to her soul, relying on her soul to help her, instead of God. Let me show you this. He said, the Spirit entered into me when He spoke to me and set me upon my feet. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost jerk. Now, some of you may have not had to experience that. I've had the power of God hit me in service when I get ready to preach, jerked me to the point where I'm standing and I'm frozen in this position. Amen. And I know God said, absolutely never left me. I got ready to preach in the old Pentecostal church in Northeast Arkansas. I'll never forget it. I got my message all ready. I get to the platform. They gave me this great big introduction. I opened the book. It fell to a particular passage and then I was not prepared to preach. And God asked me the question, are you desperate for God? Gave me a message that I preached 15 times in 15 different churches. And every time that word was inside of me, it impacted the people. Are you desperate for God? Mm -hmm. I can still remember that you are you have to hunger for more he's going to take you places you've never been he's going to have you do things you've never done no notes Holy Ghost bang 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 mm -hmm. and 
the preacher said, where'd you get a message like that? I said, when I got up behind your podium, the Holy Ghost struck me behind the Makuta. I mean, I'm just... Mm. Praise you, Jesus. Bad it was. I understand what Ezekiel is talking about. But I want you to see something else. Drop down to verse 5. And he talks about the condition of the people that they're rebellious and they're rebelling the nation, the impudent children and stiff-hearted, I mean, stiff-necked people. But look what he says in verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Yeah. See, a real prophet <coughs> doesn't just wear a label. He speaks and proclaims the word of God with power and authority. Amen. Yes. That's what separates a person who has the office and somebody who has been given the title. Right. That's another message. Now, how will I know what I'm hearing, brother? Philippians 4 and 7 says, Hearing God brings peace. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Through what? Through the anointed Son of God. Not through your intellect. Not through your ability to reason. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule. The word rule there is umpire. How many know when you have a battle in your mind? You're in the seven ending. You have two outs. Actually, you're in the ninth inning, almost the eleventh inning. You're, the game's about over. And you're at bat and you're the worst batter on the team. And you're all a deadlock. Two away. You got two strikes and three balls. Now you're up on the plate. Said, all right, boy. Can you hear the coach? He's the catalyst. Come on, boy. Hey, you can do it, boy. You got it. Straight that bat. Connect it. Connect it, boy. Hit. Meet the ball. You can hear me. Come on. Hit it. Run, run, run in the backfield. And the little fella standing there shaking in his boots and he going, oh, what if I miss? We're going to be tired and it's going to be playing an extra inning. I can win it all. But I don't know if I have it in me to win. So he begins to think about the situation and all this is in a nanosecond. Because the pitcher is ready to pitch. Oh, yeah. So he steps out of the batter's box. You know, he's practicing. Making it look good, boy. And he, he wiggles it, ready to go. And he believes in God. And he hears this word. Let this peace rule you. Let me be the umpire of your mind. One side is saying you, we got you beat. The other side says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do it. Everything's impossible with you, but everything's possible with God. And the little fellow said, that sounds it. I got the piece of it. Come on, bring it on. He hits it over the fence. And the score is 3-2. And the game is over. But the humble soldier of God said, it wasn't me that did it. That's right. <laughs> the truth being is, I was scared. Worse than that, I was doubting myself. On top of the list, I'm the worst batter in the league. But I connected with God. And God says, you can do all things. Greater is he that is in you. He knocks the ball over. But it's a process to do that. He's the kid that works the hardest. He practices more than everybody else. And finally, I have to say this on video for Pastor Diane. Mm -hmm. In high school, she is the worst free throw shooter in basketball. Mm -hmm. And the team is locked up, tied. 
and they found her. And her mother went, Dear Jesus, everybody knows in school she can't make a ring up. From the free throw line, she said, I stepped back. She said, Jesus, help me. I got to the line, and I couldn't throw it over, so I did the next best thing. I threw it under, and it hit the ring, and it went round and round <laughs> and round, and it fell. And they carried me on their shoulders. We had won the game. And I became known as a great basketball player who couldn't even make a ring. <laughs> So here, the Bible says, let this peace rule your heart, for you are called to one body to be thankful. The enemy at the gate, besides St. Ballad and his SWAT team, is called reason and logic. Isaiah 1 18 says, come and let us reason. The word reason in Hebrew means convinced, convicted, chastened. Reason and logic are first cousins. And they'll double team you to try to make you question yourself, mm -hmm. question God. Do you, believe, you really think you heard God speak to you? Let me close with this. Here's how we hear. Exodus 29, verse 20. You can write this down and check this out later. The ear, the natural ear, is made of three compartments. The external, the middle, and the inner ear. The external ear, the pina and auditory, auditory canal, is able to distinguish sound. I'll skip all the, the Greek words. The eternal ear is able to distinguish sounds. The middle ear is connected to the external is able to define sounds. Isn't it interesting how this little flap on the side of your head works? Mm -hmm. But the inner ear it has a different type of gland. It knows the sound. That will preach by itself. John 16, 33 says, Our help is the Holy Spirit, and He knows all things. Here's how you know, and we'll close. After you hear, Jeremiah 7, verse 2 said, Stand, take a step in the gate, the entrance of the Lord's house, and proclaim what you hear. There, this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye Judah, that enter these gates to worship the Lord. When you come to worship God at this gate, you worship God in a bowing down position. It's called Shekah. And know where you're standing. You're standing in the presence of God. And God, Numbers 23, 19, is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he not said it, shall he not bring it to pass. Amen. Committed that scripture over 30 years ago to memory. And I know in every situation I come, whoever's speaking to me, I go back and have my checklist. Does it have peace? Is it truth? Is it flaky? Is it demanding? Every time I hear a demanding voice, I discord it. It's not the voice of God. He can reprimand you, but he's not going to do it in that fashion. He's not going to make you feel worse than a dog for not obeying him. He'll come back with the same method of love and kindness. If you need to be reproved, he'll reprove you. So here's old Nehemiah. Jehovah is my comfort. He comes to this old gate in clothing. This is my second clothing. He says to him, the people are there, Neil, what kind of people does he have? Old school. Mm -hmm. What kind of workers? Old school. What kind of setting? Old school. Is there any hope? Yes. 
Sometimes it's okay to start with the old school because that's all you have until more will be given to you. And so I'm saying all this, in this series we've been talking about the year of turnaround. It is evident to me as a pastor of this church that we're going to have to change the way we do church. If we want to embody people and encourage people to come, we're going to have to do some things that will encourage the younger to come. We may have to listen to some of that younger music and, you know, hallelujah. Uh, some of that stuff's got some anointing on it. Some of it doesn't. But not compromise with them because they're going to need us and we need them to give them what we got. So should we go the way of the grave? They can take it to, to the kingdom age when Jesus appears. The youth out there today, in my observation only, going around the city, they've been taught about what's in it for me, gimme, 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 this is what I want, it's all about me, it's all about me. And what's happening is, they're not coming into a greater understanding of intimacy, even though they want to be in the presence of God, to understand who God is, because they have no experience. And they have no word to sustain them. And so the old generals, pardon me, don't get insulted, the older people, the older men, and the older women of the church are going to embrace and help them and, and do some discipling taking time with them and doing things with them. And having, we're believing God to bring musicians in with the fresh, fresh music, with some fresh breath, and that's what we're going to do.